So good morning, everyone. Today I'll talk about obstructive sleep apnea. Uh, since we have seen uh, so many patients who have sleep apnea with the other comorbid conditions in the clinic, and it uh, also highly affects our clinical management and treatment management of neurological disorder. So I thought it, this will be a great opportunity to talk about today. Here is my outline today. First, I will explain the definition and then a little bit about uh, underlying pathogenesis and the epidemiology and the clinical presentation and uh, uh, how to diagnose and what are the best treatment options. So obstructive sleep apnea is uh, characterized by uh, collapse upper airways during sleep with uh, inefficient respiratory response and intermittent hypoxia and sleep disruptions. Uh, a little bit about the history of the disease. Uh, there is a line from uh, uh, one of Shakespeare's play, which is uh, uh, nicely described sleep apnea. Uh, fast asleep behind the arras and snorting like a horse. Hark, how hard he fetched breath in 1592. And then also this is a uh, jaw, which is characterized by uh, Charles Dickens uh, in one of uh, his uh, novels, the Pickwick Papers. As you can see here, this is a typical clinical definitions of sleep apnea. Overweight person and enlarged neck circumference. circumference. The National Commission on Sleep Disorder Research was established by Congress in 1988 uh, to develop a long range plan for the use and organization of national resources to deal effectively with sleep disorder research and medicine. And one of the uh, first study done by Dr. Young and his colleagues in 1993, uh, they reported among 1,602 men and women, 4% uh, of women and 9% of men have 15 or more episodes of apnea per hour of sleep. Uh, the pathogenesis of sleep apnea is multifactorial. There are anatomical and non-anatomical factors. Uh, uh, there are anatomical and non-anatomical causes. Uh, the combination of uh, which uh, likely varies uh, substantially between patients. So as you can see, there are some neuromuscular factors. For example, they decre decrease activity of upper airway muscles and uh, significant attenuation on the negative pressure reflex re response during sleep. And also <clears throat> uh, REM sleep is associated with muscle autonomy affecting anti-gravity muscles. And also there are some upper airway mechanics factors and also structural factors. As you can see here in this image more clearly, on, uh, in the left image on the EEG record, uh, we are seeing low arousal threshold. Uh, the gray tracing indicate the desired response, but here is the response uh, that we uh, see from EEG record. Also in the right image on the EMG record, we also see poor muscle responsiveness. And there, is some, there are some anatomical structure uh, abnormalities, for example, the retrognathy, or narrow, crowded, collapsible upper airway. And uh, in pulmonary function testing, we also can see ventilatory dis disturbance, uh, for example, high loop gain. Epidemiology, uh, it is seen commonly in older males, but after the menopause, uh, the incidence rates are similar in women and men. Uh, the estimated prevalence in North America is uh, 15 to 30 percent in males and 10 to 50 percent in females. And also the prevalence depends on uh, race. So it is more prevalent in young African Americans compared with Caucasians of the same age group. 
And despite lower rates of obesity in Asia, the prevalence of uh, sleep apnea is similar uh, uh, to United States. Uh, it is because uh, differences uh, of cranial structural abnormalities. So why uh, it is so important for the clinicians? Because differently from other common sleep disorder, 80% of patients with obstructive sleep apnea show multiple comorbidities. As you can see here in the image, uh, orange line represent two or three comorbidities and green gray line represent uh, four or more comor comorbidities. And here are uh, some major comorbidities that uh, we can see with uh, sleep apnea, for example, systemic hypertension, cardiovascular events, uh, arrhythmias, cerebrovascular disease, and several studies reported an increased risk of stroke in sleep apnea patients. So uh, most of the patients uh, with symptoms uh, do not report them to their primary care physician. So uh, C-Clinic could be beneficial for the patient who have major risk factors. For example, uh, obesity, male gender, older age, smoking, uh, uh, family history of obstructive sleep apnea, treatment resistant, resistant hypertension, atrial fibrillation, stroke type 2 diabetes, and acromegaly, and so on. So what are the main symptoms? Snoring, that is bothersome to others. Uh, gasping, choking during sleep. Uh, feeling unrefreshed after waking up. Daytime sleepness, morning headache, reduced quality of life, and also impaired sleep quality of bed partners. And uh, there are also some atypical presentation that uh, we should be aware of, such as, such as depressive symptoms, decreased libido and frequent nocturnal awakening. And also patients can describe being in a brain fog or having difficulty concentrating. Sometimes present with insomnia and fatigue, but we need to ask about uh, detailed questions. We need to ask detailed question about insomnia uh, because sleep maintenance insomnia, which means difficulty with falling back to sleep after nocturnal awakening, is more likely related to sleep apnea. So uh, sleep maintenance insomnia uh, is uh, more important than sleep onset insomnia for um, sleep apnea. So the AASM recommends asking all adults whether they are dissatisfied with their sleep or have daytime sleepness as part of a routine health maintenance evaluation and also recommends uh, screening patients who have high risk driving occupations because of the potential public, public health effect. So there are so many screening tests, but I would like to just mention three of them. This is top uh, bank screening test. If, uh, if answering yes to three or more questions that indicates high risk for sleep apnea, as you can see, there are uh, 80 parameters in this questionnaire, questionnaire. And there is also a Berlin questionnaire. There are three, uh, there are three categories in this questionnaire. Uh, if uh, there are two or more positive categories, that indicate high risk for sleep apnea. And also this is a for sleepness scale, uh, which is trying to quantify uh, the sleepness of a person. Uh, if the scores greater than 10, this is, uh, are, this is consistent with excessive daytime sleepness and should prompt further clinical evaluation. So uh, as a clinical bottom line, it is reasonable to consider asking about sleep problems as part of a review of cell systems, particularly in high risk populations. And physical examination, we should examine respiratory, cardiovascular and neurologic systems. And also we should note degree of obesity 
and we need to measure neck circumferences. And also there is modified Malam Pati score, which as you can see here in this image, uh, if you can see both soft palate and uvula, uh, this is class one. Uh, if we just can see uvula, this is class two. If we can see base of the uvula only, this is class three. And the soft plate and uvula are not visible at all, this is class four. And also uh, we need to check if there is any sign of nasal obstruction, macroglossy, tonsillar hypertrophia or elongated uvula. The polysomnography is the gold standard, uh, but there are two types of sleep study uh, that we can order. One of them home sleep apnea testing and the other one in laboratory testing. So uh, each of them have their own cons and pros. Uh, home sleep apnea testing, as you can see here, there are pulse oximetry and chest band to measure ventilatory response and also uh, uh, recording, uh, uh, recording things. And it's uh, more uh, cheaper and relatively easy to self-apply and uh, patients can access more easily and broadly and it leads to more rapid initiation of the treatment. But on the other hand, it does not include EEG, it only records respiratory channels and uh, some insurance plans such as many Medicaid programs do not cover this. And in laboratory testing, uh, we should consider this when uh, we are thinking differential diagnosis because it's, it provides uh, both respiratory and non-respiratory information uh, such as uh, sleep latency, sleep efficiency, uh, and also assessment of any EEG epileptiform activity, nocturnal arrhythmia, limp movements, and video or audio recording of sleep-related behaviors. So uh, it gives us uh, more specific and uh, broadly um, results. And also it's more suitable for patients who are unable to complete home uh, sleep uh, assessment testing. Uh, if uh, there is unstable housing condition or cognitive or physical disabilities. Here there are some um, terminologies and uh, the, also the definitions of sleep apnea. Uh, apnea means breathing cessation, cessation for greater than 10 seconds and hypopnea breathing flow reduction for greater than 10 seconds accompanied by uh, more than three or four uh, percent oxyhemoglobin desaturation or arousal from sleep. And also AHI means number of apnea and hypopnea episodes per hour of sleep. And uh, respiratory event index means number of apnea and hypopnea ep episodes per hour of recording. So the definitions, uh, mild obstructive sleep apnea is uh, more than five apnea hypopnea index or respiratory event index and uh, lower than 15 events per hour and moderate sleep apnea, uh, apnea hypopnea index or respiratory event index greater than 15 but lower than 30 events per hour. Uh, which patients require treatment? So high level evidence, evidence indicates that patients with daytime sleepness, regardless of severity, should be offered therapy. And also those who have recently had a motor vehicle accident or near misattributable to sleepness should be aggressively treated. And uh, the, the other point that I want to mention, oh, yeah. CPAP therapy. Oh, God. CPAP therapy should not be routinely recommended to asymptomatic patient with moderate sleep apnea because there is no evidence that asymptomatic patient with mild sleep apnea are at elevated cardiovascular risk and would benefit from treatment. 
So three, there are three main treatment options. Uh, uh, the major one is CPAP, and the other one is mandibular, mandibular advancement devices, which uh, hold the mandible in a forward position, but it is less effective than CPAP. And the other option is surgical intervention, but it's obviously invasive, and the improvement in septum, symptoms in, is generally small. Here is the treatment chart. If uh, the patient is overweight, we can recommend some data restriction and also we can consider bariatric surgery. And if there are any craniofacial malformation, we can consider maxillofacial surgery or adenotensolectomy. And we also need to check nasal breathing. And if there is any problem, we can treat with topical steroids and consider nasal sur surgery. And after that, we can start CPAP therapy. But the main therapy is CPAP. So first, we need to educate uh, patients and then uh, try uh, to uh, using them. Uh, and then if the trial is successful, we can recommend long-term CPAP. But the periodic revelation of symptoms and the follow-up uh, for treatment adherence is very important. So if the CPAP is unacceptable or not feasible for the patients, and there is no temporomandibular joint pain, we can consider mandibular advancement device. So uh, CPAP therapy is the first line treatment. Uh, most of studies shows a, show a linear relationship between hours of use and improvements in sleepness and quality of life. Uh, adequate adherence uh, is described as a four or more hours of use per night on 70% of nights. So this is also the sensitization protocol, uh, which, uh, is, uh, which makes easier to use for the patients. So with this protocol, the patient getting used to use CPAP machine step by step. Uh, so step one, uh, first uh, the patient uh, turn on the CPAP device and hold the mask in front of the face and start to breathe calmly for a few minutes and repeat this several times a day until it uh, feels comfortable and then they can proceed to step two. And step two, with the mask and a charge from the CPAP device, place, on, place the mask on the face for 15 minutes at a time while doing normal daily activities and repeat several times until they feel comfortable, then they can proceed to step three. I think this is more important for the patient because it's very hard to adjust the CPAP treatment. So it's uh, much more easier to use CPAP machine with this uh, protocol. Uh, as a final clinical bottom line today, so all patients with obstructive sleep apnea should be encouraged to pursue conservative measures such as weight control and avoidance of al alcohol and sedatives before bedtime. And sim symptomatic patients, particularly those with drowsy driving, should be aggressively treated because of the public health. CPAP is considered the primary therapy and therapy initiation requires close follow-up. And many factors facilitate patient acceptance of an adherence to CPAP therapy, including education, particip participation, mask selection, early troubleshooting of problems and behavioral strategy to be able to increase motivation and self-efficacy. So maximizing adherence to therapy is important in order to maximize symptom resolution and blood pressure reduction. Thank you for your time. I will stop here.